Ngatamwa. We respectfully acknowledge the Pikarong and Gundujamara people of the Eastern Ma Nation as the traditional owners of the land and sea, where Beach Patrol conducts its beach cleanup activities. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This presentation is about Beach Patrol 3280-3284. It will cover the types of marine debris we find, what this tells us about where it's coming from and what we aim to do about it. Marine debris, also known as marine litter, is human waste that has been deliberately or accidentally released into the ocean. Australia has a reputation for beautiful clean beaches, so when we began noticing high amounts of marine debris on our beaches, it was a bit of a shock. In fact, in our region, we have a particularly high amount of marine debris washing up, much more than most other coastlines around Australia. In the past few years, our volunteers have removed over six tonne of rubbish off the beach. We are getting closer to a milestone of one million pieces of marine litter. Some of our beaches have been likened to the polluted beaches of Indonesia. This is all pretty strange for an area that is hundreds of kilometres away from a capital city. Our more remote beaches are the ones with the most rubbish. So what can we do about it? The bad news is, Scientists predict that by the year 2050 that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. The good news is this is a prediction only and is based on current trends and inputs. Although worldwide marine litter is a major environmental problem, it is one of the easiest ones to solve if we commit to it. What if we imagine a different future for our oceans and work towards that? What if by the year 2030 we lived in a zero waste society and there were zero inputs into the ocean. There are so many ideas already out there on how we can reduce our waste. If we continue to remove what's already out there by cleaning up our beaches and oceans, and if we stop all forms of littering from land and boats, then by 2050 our oceans could be clean, healthy, full of life, abundant, and with no wildlife being harmed by our waste. At Beach Patrol, we are actively working towards that better future. So Beach Patrol is a network of volunteers who keep our ocean and beaches clean, safe and healthy by removing marine debris. We run cleanups with school groups, scouting groups and community groups. We welcome people of all ages to join in and get involved. Beach Patrol holds group cleanups once a month. Group cleanups are fantastic for collecting large amounts of rubbish all at once and it's also a great social activity. Many of our members also undertake independent cleanups of their own each week. Basically, just picking up rubbish on their regular beach walks. We are very flexible about how and when and where people want to perform their cleanups. We clean up litter at public beaches, river mouths, foreshores, remote beaches, and sometimes beach car parks too. And the types of litter we find varies from location to location. As citizen scientists working on the issue of marine debris, we are passionate, curious and driven to solve the problem. We can learn so much about the many ways people use the ocean just by what washes up on our shores. We've been consistently cleaning up since mid-August 2017. And by consistent, our group averages five cleanups a week. That's a lot of time on our beaches. We record all of our cleanups. We sort, count, classify, and photograph what we collect. This gives us invaluable data that helps us quantify how much we are collecting and identifies the type of marine debris washing up. Through this citizen scientist data, we can then identify the inputs, pathways, and sources of marine litter and create plans to stop plastic entering our waterways and oceans in the first place. We use the app Litter Stopper to record our cleanups. Litter Stopper is incredibly fast and easy to use. The data we upload is fed straight to the government and helps inform policy around Victoria's waste issues. Anyone can use this app. You don't need to be part of a group. You can just pop in your email and away you go. It can be used to record both street litter and beach litter. Many of us take photos of what we collect and publish the photos on our Beach Patrol Facebook group. 
This photographic documentation shows others who may not venture to the beach what is happening locally on our beaches. We get to compare what we find on our beaches with other beach cleanup groups in other regions, cities and countries. Sometimes we ask for help in identifying unusual plastic wash-ups. And we can use our photographs to lobby government policymakers and industries about problematic plastics that are polluting our oceans. Taking beach walks and finding and removing marine debris as you go can be fun, interesting and educational. It's also great for your fitness, health and well-being. You get to experience and connect with nature. Collecting marine debris is something easy and tangible that we can all do to protect the environment and create a better future. Plastics break up and up into smaller pieces, making them harder to clean up and more likely to be eaten by wildlife. If we want to avoid turning our oceans into dangerous places full of plastic confetti soup, then we need to collect rubbish when we see it. By removing plastic items off our beaches today, we can help reduce the impacts of plastic pollution tomorrow. The catalyst that started us on our mission to clean up beaches was finding Shelley Beach littered with plastic cotton bud stems. Cotton buds are sewage related debris. It's plastic that has been flushed down the toilet and has made its way into the ocean via the wastewater sewage ocean outfall. The discovery of a beach littered in cotton buds led a small group of volunteers to clean up Shelley Beach once a week and record their findings. They called their Facebook group Pick Up Sticks. A few months into the formation of Pick Up Sticks, momentum for the group and awareness about plastic pollution swelled when millions of nurdles escaped the wastewater treatment plant into the ocean at Thunder Point. Through this incident, more people became concerned about the impacts of marine debris along our coast and began cleaning up at other beaches. You might not see much rubbish on our public beaches, so you might be forgiven for thinking our beaches are relatively clean. But if you venture further afield to some of our more remote beaches, you might get a bit of a wake-up call. You would think after four years and over 2,000 cleanups that our beaches would be spotless. And in comparison to how they were four years ago, some of them are. But as long as litter and waste continues to be leaked into the ocean, then the amount of marine debris will continue to rise. So what is washing up on our beaches? Let's have a look at our top five worst offenders. The number one plastic on our beaches is nurdles. These are tiny pre-production pallets that were released through our wastewater ocean outfall. Nurdles are problematic because they soak up pollutants and become toxic. They never disappear from the ocean completely, they just get smaller and smaller. Marine animals and seabirds mistake nurdles for food, allowing them to enter the food chain. They are very difficult to remove from the environment once released into the ocean. Even though an army of volunteers have collected over 650,000 nurdles from our beaches, they continue to be a monster of a problem and five years later are still found on most beach visits. Our second most common plastic on our beaches is broken up hard plastic fragments. Plastic hard fragments are plastic items that are broken up into smaller pieces. According to the AMDI, that's the Australian Marine Debris Initiative database, over 400 million pieces have been collected around Australia. Hard plastic remnants is the most common plastic marine debris item collected on beaches throughout Australia. Broken up plastic items can eventually break up into microplastics. It is thought that these remnants cannot be linked back to their source, but by looking at the colours, thickness and type of plastic, some of these plastics can be traced back to their original form as a plastic item. One thing we do know is that these hard remnants are not coming from stormwater or rivers. The plastic that is washed out of rivers and stormwater isn't the same type of plastic that would break up into these hard remnants. Here's what we think the hard remnants are from. The white remnants are breaking up from buckets, containers, yogurt containers, ice cream containers, toilet cleaner containers, fishing crates and lids. The blue remnants are breaking up 
from water bottle lids, drums, barrels, fishing crates and chemical and detergent containers. The red remnants are breaking up from rock lobster pot necks and bait baskets. 30% of the hard remnants we've collected, an estimated 56,000 pieces, are red pieces from the rock lobster fishing pots. The brown remnants have broken up from bait baskets. The green remnants have broken up from detergent containers, buckets and chemical drums. Yellow and orange remnants are breaking up from detergent containers and buoys and fishing gear. Black remnants have broken up from rock lobster pot necks, bait baskets, fishing crates and barrels. There are probably plenty more items we can add to this list, but these are some of the items we see washed up on the beach that break up into these hard remnants. The most likely source of all these items mentioned here is boats and ships. Our third most common item found on our beaches is the plastic stems from cotton buds. We created a successful campaign to stop this from happening, which you will hear about later in this presentation. Our fourth most common plastic is fishing rope scraps and nets. Fishing rope and nets are made from plastic and are extremely strong and durable, taking decades to break down. Green rope scraps are linked to trawler nets being mended on boats and piers. These small green straps litter the Portland Pier and surrounding area and can easily fall into the ocean where they become a danger to marine animals and seabirds. This type of marine debris could easily be stopped if the right people commit to doing something about it. Our fifth most common plastic is bottle lids. Bottle lids are highly buoyant. While the bottle and containers break up, the lids remain in the environment indefinitely. In 2021, we undertook a bottle lid audit with Warrnambool East Primary School so we could understand where all our bottle lids were coming from. We sampled 5,430 lids of the 14,000 lids that we've so far collected. Many of these types of bottle lids are related to shipping and boating litter rather than from land-based litter sources. We found that of the lids that could be identified, the top five brands were Aqua, Coca-Cola, Kupi Mayonnaise, Sendi and Kaki Tiga. Aqua Water, Sendi Health Drink and Kaki Tiga Water are all Indonesian brands, not sold in Australia. Coca-Cola and the Japanese brand Kupi are both sold internationally. Of the lids that could be identified, 179 were brands sold in Australia, while 757 were branded lids only sold overseas. It was interesting to find so many water bottle lids washing up on our beaches that are from Southeast Asia. We hope you will watch our bottle lid audit video to learn more. What are the impacts of marine debris on our wildlife? We think our work cleaning up marine debris and acting as guardians of our coastline is critically important. Removing marine debris not only makes our beaches nicer and safer to visit, but more importantly, it reduces threats to wildlife through entanglement and harmful ingestion. Scientists believe each year marine waste kills at least 100,000 marine animals and 1 million seabirds. This harm and death is completely avoidable. Uh, walking down the dunes, um, I saw this, what appeared to be a bundle of rope. Um, as I got closer, I saw it was a, a little seal um, that was looking quite exhausted. Um, it actually had part of the, the rope um, sort of threaded through its mouth um, and the rest was sort of bundled around it, its back, so obviously hadn't been able to feed. So we just used blankets to restrain it and then just cut it free using one of these um, blades that we actually use for whale disentanglement work. So it's a nice safe blade, it's blunt on one side and it's really sharp on the inside. So we just cut through each little strand individually just very carefully. Uh, and it's somehow picked up a bit of drift net somewhere and um, that's really compromised its ability to survive. So it's come ashore here, unable to swim basically. And if we hadn't found it and cut it free, then it certainly would have died. Um, 
So that's really sad and I guess the message is that uh, this sort of discarded rubbish in the ocean is a real problem for wildlife. This cute sub-Antarctic seal would have died if it hadn't been saved by local authorities after it had been reported by one of our beach patrol members. The Australian Government Science Agency, the CSIRO, found ingesting plastic was responsible for killing animals across 80 different species. Whales, dolphins and turtles were especially at risk from eating plastic film. That's the soft plastic used in plastic bags and wrapping. With seabird deaths linked more with ingestion of hard plastic fragments and balloons. In our region, plastic pollution has the potential to harm 16 species of marine mammals and 209 species of shorebirds and seabirds. Southern right whales can get caught up in ghost nets or fishing rope and drown as a result. The common sea dragon, endemic to Australia's Great Southern Reefs, feeds on tiny crustaceans, making it particularly vulnerable to microplastic pollution. Little penguins can be harmed by plastic in three ways, by entanglement, by directly eating it, or by indirect ingestion of fish that have consumed microplastics. Seals and dolphins can get entangled in lost or discarded fishing gear. Hooda plovers feed along the shoreline and among the washed up seaweed. They can mistake microplastics for food, or their feet could get entangled in fishing line. Fish, birds, seals, dolphins and whales can become entangled in rope and netting, damaging limbs, restricting movement and drowning. Fishing line can catch around the legs, wings, necks, beaks of birds, causing serious injury. Sea and shorebirds are particularly vulnerable to getting their feet entangled in fishing line, severely restricting their mobility so they become easy prey for other animals. When the line tightens enough without relief, limbs can be critically disabled, even amputated. In order to stop wildlife being harmed by our waste, we need to stop waste from entering the ocean. We need to know where it's all coming from. So where does plastic polluting our oceans come from? The plastic we collect from the beach can be old or new. It can have traveled short or long distances. It can be litter from land or from sea. It can be from multiple sources and have arrived on the beach through multiple pathways. The type of rubbish we collect from our public foreshore areas looks very different to what we collect on our more remote ocean beaches. Generally, rubbish in public areas comes from us, the public, whereas rubbish on our remote beaches comes from ships and boats. The bottom line is though, all marine litter comes from us. Humans are the source and every single person has the power and the responsibility to prevent it. Land-based sources and pathways include Plastic litter that has reached the ocean via our stormwater drains or rivers. Plastic litter that has been discharged into the ocean via our sewage and wastewater ocean outfalls. And plastic litter that has been littered on beaches, foreshore areas, car parks and piers. Litter that has been dropped in the street can make its way to the ocean via a network of stormwater drains. Stormwater drains carry litter from our streets into our rivers and oceans. Sometimes litter has blown into the stormwater from overfilled bins or rubbish that has blown out of bins. And sometimes litter can unintentionally get blown from our local schools and sporting grounds. Our car parks, particularly those in scenic areas, are often littered with cigarette butts and takeaway food packaging too. Several cleanups undertaken by the Turum Scouts has resulted in thousands of cigarette butts being taken out of the environment. Many people do not realise that cigarette butts are plastic and that the chemicals in cigarette butts are toxic to wildlife and leach into our waterways. A single butt can take up to 10 years to break down. During the spring and summer months, the amount of litter in public places increases. The Warrnambool breakwater is littered with cigarette butts from recreational fishers and visitors. Some recreational fishers have also been known to leave fishing line, hooks, sinkers, cigarette butts and beer stubbies on piers and jetties by rivers and the ocean. 
After going fishing, some bury their bait bags and rubbish in the sand on our remote ocean beaches. Fishing line happens to be one of the most dangerous plastics for our birds. Divers who clean up under the water near the breakwater find plenty of evidence of discarded fishing items by irresponsible fishers. Divers also find litter discarded by the general public. Generally, at the river mouths and public foreshore areas, the most common litter is consumer items. We find straws, cigarette butts, lolly wrappers, takeaway food packaging, dog poo bags, shopping bags, soft plastic remnants, bottle lids, alcohol cans and bottles, and plastic water and soft drink bottles. This is standard for city beaches and urbanized areas, and is mainly a result of people being grubs and treating our environment like a trash can. Not all this litter will make it into the ocean, but it does have the potential to. And if we're going to talk about land-based litter, let's not forget the illegal dumping of rubbish in coastal scrublands. It's hard to comprehend why some people see our beautiful natural environment, not as an important coastal habitat for animals and birds, but as a place to dump their rubbish. Dumping rubbish in nature is a despicable act. The rubbish is harmful to wildlife and it destroys the enjoyment of these places for people who like to spend time in nature. Luckily, we have plenty good people in our towns cleaning up after litter bugs. People such as Dorothy, who rides around on her bike collecting rubbish that has been thrown from cars. Businesses such as the Pavilion, who once a day clean up the foreshore area in front of their cafe and our local schools and scouting groups who regularly do cleanups. Great people like these keep our streets, beaches and foreshore areas free of litter, so it's more enjoyable for everyone. I mention them here to point out that our environment and town will look a whole lot dirtier and messier without a whole lot of people lending a hand to keeping it clean. And also to make the point that most rubbish cleaned up goes unrecognised and unrecorded, and therefore it is hard for our government policymakers to know the true extent of our litter problems. That's why we encourage people to use the Litter Stopper app to record what they collect. The data collector helps the government to understand that litter and waste is having a big impact on our environment, and to understand which litter items are the worst offenders so that they can be prioritised to be fixed. Sewage and wastewater plastics are also land-based litter, but these plastics are discharged directly into the ocean and can then wash back on our local beaches. After it's been treated, wastewater from industries and sewage water from our households flows into the ocean at Thunder Point via an ocean outfall. Plastics used in industry and in households can flow down drains such as kitchen sinks and laundries or be flushed down toilets to reach the ocean. Two out of our five most commonly found items are sewage wastewater related debris. To reach the ocean, nurdles have come from an industrial factory and cotton buds have been flushed down toilets. Past and present debris from our wastewater and sewage outfall also includes weasling clamps from the abattoirs, wool and lamb castration rings from the sale yards, Colgate Sensodyne toothpaste tubes, seals, clothing pegs, clothing tag fasteners, sock tags, dental floss and sticks, diabetes lancets, IV caps, insulin pen needle caps, medications, home hair dye kit tube snap lids, eye makeup applicators, hair roller pins, shower curtain hooks and rings, jelly fruit cutoffs, fruit stickers, insulin syringes and intravenous drug syringes, palm olive body wash pull ring locks, ointment tube triangle seals, small snaps of ointments, pen lids and pens, pen ends and clickers, personal lubricant applicator tops, plastic ampule tops, small toys, tiling spaces and wedges, sanitary pad backing strips, tampon packaging, tampons, wipes, toilet fresheners, sewage grease balls, aka fatberg or fat balls. Fat balls collected on Shelley Beach were tested by Macquarie University. 544 microfibers 
were found in just one single ping pong sized fat ball. Can you imagine just how many microplastics are discharged through Australia's ocean outfalls every single day? We've also collected over 3,000 toothbrushes on and near Shelley Beach. Toothbrushes are often found in household pipes by plumbers, and so many of these may have escaped from the wastewater treatment plant. Toothbrushes are also discarded from ships. Items that we would normally associate with stormwater litter, such as lollipop sticks and straws, have also made their way down household sinks to reach the ocean through the sewage pathway. Plastics coated in fat, oil and grease, also known as fog, confirms that these items and many other plastics escape from our households, commercial kitchens, hospitals, local factories and industries through the sewage network and end up being discharged into the ocean. Sewage related debris is a subject too political for most marine debris researchers to broach and therefore the issue of sewage waste and plastics polluting our oceans mainly goes ignored when discussing, reporting on or investigating the sources of marine debris in Australia. Land-based litter also includes some historical waste issues. There is an old rubbish tip on East Beach, Port Ferry, which has breached several times, leaching rubbish into the ocean. And erosion along our coastline can lead to old rubbish deposits buried in the sand to resurface. The rubbish that washes out of our sand dunes during big seas includes old polystyrene foam, old glass bottles, plastic film and fishing ropes. Ocean-based sources of litter and pathways include the commercial fishing industry, international shipping, and a small portion will float here from elsewhere on the ocean currents. Commercial fishers may accidentally lose fishing gear. Past and present commercial fishing items include fishing nets and ropes, rubber gloves, strapping bands, rock gloves for fishing pots and parts, bait baskets, fishing crates, and the hard plastic remnants that these items will break up into. Past and present items from international shipping include drink bottles, food packaging, glass jars and sauce bottles, dishwashing liquid containers and toilet cleaner bottles, foldable plastic forks, galley waste such as Nescafe jars and lids, tins of cigarettes, often full of used dirty cigarettes, industrial garbage bag knots, indicative of bags of rubbish being dumped overboard, and the hard plastic remnants that these items break up into. Bobs of melted plastic in all shapes, colours and sizes also wash up. These are thought to be the result from incomplete combustion of plastic waste in ship's incinerators. Although there is legislation in place, international ships do illegally dispose of garbage at sea. Other items that are likely to have come off boats and ships include cigarette lighters, men's hair combs, men's personal care products, industrial chemicals, barrels, light globes and tubes, and toothbrushes. We collect a lot more marine debris on our remote beaches than our public beaches. What washes up on these beaches is true marine debris and a great indicator of the types of plastic polluting our oceans. We have found that a much greater proportion of plastic waste originates from marine activities rather than land-based ones. How does seasons, currents, wind and waves influence what we collect? Our coastline is highly dynamic, so depending on the day we visit the beach, we might find loads of marine debris or very little. Collectively, our beach patrol members have built up a strong knowledge base about marine debris, gathered from visiting beaches in all kinds of weather and seasons and observing the beach in all kinds of states. In spring and summer, we don't collect as much rubbish on our remote beaches. This is because the easterly and northerly winds tends to blow rubbish offshore and we don't have as many big storms. In autumn and winter, we collect much more ocean-based rubbish as the big swells and storms bring all the rubbish into shore. There are several factors that will impact on what we collect on a single day. Southerly and westerly winds blow debris on shore, whereas northerly and easterly winds tends to blow debris offshore. 
Big waves may dump heavy debris on shore, whereas a flat sea may mean there is not enough energy for the ocean to dump the debris on shore. A windy day may whip up sand and cover debris in sand centimetres thick, and so the beach looks completely clean. A wild storm may thrash at the dunes and beach, dislodging sand and exposing buried marine debris. Floating seaweed captures floating plastic and brings it ashore. Fishing rope and nets are often tangled in the weeds. A tide can wash a tide line of plastic in or wash one away. Sometimes a raft of plastic and pumice stone will wash up. Pumice is volcanic stone. We are unsure of the origins of these plastic wash-ups or why pumice and plastic float together. A recent pollution incident will also impact on how much and what we find. There has been very little research on how marine debris behaves in the Southern Ocean and no scientific research for our region. Oceanographers know that there are five great garbage patches in each of the major oceans but have not been able to find a garbage patch in the Southern Indian Ocean and have asked the question, where does all the rubbish go? On some days, we think all the rubbish is washed up here. Garbage patches are large areas of the ocean where litter, fishing gear and other debris collects. They are formed by rotating ocean currents called gyres. You can think of them as big whirlpools that pull objects in. Maybe through our citizen science investigations and looking at what's washing up, we can help oceanographers answer the big question about garbage in the Southern Ocean. Our remote beaches between Warrnambool and Port Ferry face the Great Southern Ocean and the southwesterly winds. We do know that much of our ocean-based rubbish generally comes from the west and moves along the coast in an easterly direction. We know this because we often find fishing gear from Portland and South Australia. This theory is also widely supported by marine science. Three elements that move debris around in our ocean are currents, wind and waves. Different types of plastic debris will travel at different speeds and in different ways. Fishing rope and nets, for example, generally float underneath the ocean surface within the first metre. They travel by currents and wave action. The predominant current comes from the west and moves to the east along our coast. Waves can then wash the debris into shore where we find it and collect it before it has a chance to wash back out to sea. Highly buoyant plastics such as plastic bottles, cotton buds and nurdles that float on the ocean surface travel also by the wind, stopping plastics at source. With so many possible pathways, sources and types of ocean plastic, it might seem a bit overwhelming and difficult to know where to start to address the problem. We have a system that includes cleanups, data collection, identifying problem plastics, then taking action to stop the plastic at source. Here are a few examples. In November of 2017, our volunteers discovered hundreds and thousands of nurdles along the tide line at Shelley Beach. Ocean plastic pollution was put in the spotlight when our story was reported nationally in the news. The discovery of this plastic pallet pollution event resulted in a huge community-led cleanup and raised awareness about marine debris issues. The incident was made a state to emergency and the EPA brought in a new law announcing fines of up to $777,000 for companies that were found responsible for polluting the environment with nurdles. In January 2018, and then again in January 2019, our volunteers found cartridges washed up along our beaches. We discovered there were fireworks cartridges that had been part of the official New Year's Eve fireworks display. Our reports to Council led to any future fireworks being plastic free. Reporting washed up tree log tickets in 2021 led to a local tree logging company to trial paper tickets instead of using plastic ones. The tickets get stapled to every single log exporting out of Portland. This means that 300,000 logs per ship are no longer using plastic tickets. 
Several pollution issues discovered at Shelley Beach has highlighted serious issues with pumping semi-treated sewerage and wastewater into the ocean. Is someone in your home flushing cotton buds down the toilet? Do you realise that when they flush cotton buds, they end up in the ocean? In Warrnambool, we collect 10,000 cotton buds a year off our beaches. That's a lot of cotton buds for our poor marine animals to choke on. Scientists have found whole cotton buds in turtles. Broken cotton buds have sharp edges that can stick in the throats and stomachs of fish and birds. We can stop this disgusting plastic pollution happening in our beaches here in Australia right now. We just need everyone to be better buds. And by everyone we mean you, industry and government. You can be a better bud by taking the better bud pledge. It goes like this. I pledge to never buy or use plastic stemmed cotton buds and I definitely won't flush them down the toilet. We don't have to use plastic to make cotton buds. We can make cotton buds better. There are plenty of sustainable alternatives that will break down in the sewage if someone inappropriately flushes them. Cotton buds are a single-use plastic that can't be recycled. The UK, Europe, Scotland and New Zealand have all banned plastic cotton buds. What is our Australian government doing on this issue? We want our government to be better buds by taking res responsibility for the damage plastic is doing to our ocean. We want them to ban single-use plastic stand cotton buds. Be a better bud. Keep Australia beautiful. Our oceans clean and our wildlife safe. Our cotton bud data and Better Buds campaign led to statewide bans on plastic stem cotton buds as part of the government's single-use plastic policy. Tighter EPA legislation and licence conditions, which meant that water authorities could no longer discharge plastics into the ocean. To meet these new licence conditions and community expectations, the screens at the local wastewater treatment plant were upgraded so that cotton buds and other plastics could no longer escape into the ocean. We also successfully lobbied the major supermarkets in Australia to stop selling plastic stem cotton buds and to provide sustainable alternatives. Through our campaign, we effectively stopped an estimated 8 million plastic cotton bud sticks ending up in landfill daily and tens of thousands escaping into our waterways and ocean. Our local campaign has had a national impact. From 2022, we aim to tackle lost fishing gear and illegal dumping of rubbish at sea by international ships. Learn more about rock lobster fishing debris and shipping debris by watching our explainer videos. A link to these videos can be found in the description. Apart from cleanups, data collection and campaigns, Beach Patrol engages the public in discussions about marine debris and ways to reduce our waste through social media content, competitions, art displays, public talks, research projects, school activities and education, creative signage and messaging around town, and community events. You might be wondering what happens to all the marine debris we collect off beaches. We keep some of the plastic for educational displays, all the fishing rope goes to local crafters who use it for weaving. We reuse and recycle what we can. Some plastics are sent off to scientists for research. Plenty of the plastic has been used for art projects and the rest goes to landfill. Plastic pollution is a big issue and will be solved by many people along with industries and government working together to find solutions. We hope that by showing you our local marine litter issues that you might choose to start your own campaign or choose to concentrate on a beach or litter hotspot to regularly clean up. We need everyday citizens like you to stand up and fight for our wildlife and oceans. We can all do our bit to clean up our beaches and who knows, through the simple act of picking up marine litter, 
You could inspire someone else to do the same. Every bit of litter removed is one less chance of harm being done to our wildlife. We'd love you to join Beach Patrol and be part of a community of like-minded individuals caring for our oceans and building a better future. <laughs>